Hello, and welcome to day two at Diana Initiative. Um, just as a reminder, there are a lot of things going on in addition to our amazing talks. Please be sure to visit the villages and check out the expo center where our sponsors are. And some of them are giving out great prizes. So at the very least, say hello, thank them for sponsoring, and maybe you can win something cool. Um, talking about awesomeness, I'm super excited to welcome Wendy Edwards to the stage. Everybody, please help me welcoming her. Wendy's talk is what machine learning can and can't do for security. Take it away, Wendy. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to start with an exciting slide from our sponsors. Um, basically, um, thank you so much to all these organizations for financially supporting Diana. It's, I mean, it's a great conference and it's very nice. We can all have affordable tickets. So anyhow, the, so my talk, the name of my talk is what machine learning can and can't do for security. So just a, let's start with a brief introduction. introduction. Um, I'm from Urbana, Illinois. I don't know how many of you have heard of Urbana. Probably not a lot of you, but basically about 200 kilometers or maybe 130 miles south of Chicago. And so I work as a software developer um, at a nonprofit called ASPCA. And I'm uh, a NASA data knot, and I uh, was able to participate in the 2017 SANS Women's Academy, which is a great experience. Um, I'm Wayward710 on Twitter, and my pronouns are she and her. Okay, so let's just a brief, uh, a brief, a brief discussion of what we'll talk about. We're just going to talk about terminology and concepts, because I know you hear a lot of people talk about all these things. Um, I mean, like, for example, when you go to a swag hall, how many people are talking about machine learning? Um, probably a lot, right? And so do you want to listen to them? Well, yeah, if they've got good swag, definitely. And we'll talk about some examples, and then we'll also talk about some limitations and risks of machine security. Let's start, start with first. So, you, so probably a lot of you have heard about um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, and deep learning. And they're kind of, they're all, uh, so essentially they're, they are kind of like a, bu a bunch of uh, Russian dolls. So the, basically AI contains all of them and then machine learning is a subset of AI and then deep learning is a subset of machine learning. So just starting with some, so artificial intelligence is really kind of the catch-all. It's, it's basically, so it encompasses a lot of things and it's essentially um, talks about computers trying to mimic human level intelligence. Um, Michelle, machine learning gets a little bit more specific there. Machine learning is essentially a lot of math. They're using a lot of um, algorithms and statistics uh, that we're going to get into. Um, and there's, there are a couple of, there are a couple of, of uh, types of machine learning called supervised and unsupervised. Um, so, uh, supervised is basically based on prior probability as uh, supervised very often, um, you need data with the right answers. Um, um, and so it, it's knowledge discovery using probabilities of previously observed events to infer the probabilities of new, of new events and then unsupervised learning, basically, um, you get to work, you are working with unlabeled data sets, which could be a whole lot easier to, to come up with. And so you're so unsupervised learning, you're drawing abstractions from unlabeled data sets and applying those to new data. So let's talk about what deep learning. So actually, so a neural network, it's not really a new idea at all. It was invented in 1942. So there, there so we're, we're actually gonna look at some pictures and videos of what a neural network is. So don't be too intimidated by this. Uh, you're talking about basically these multi layers of neurons um, and they're made. And so, and, um, so, and then each layer is made of a node and um, essentially, and so essentially with a neural network, it tries to, 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 to uh, determine how much weight to give each of those nodes. And we're going to go ahead, we're going to actually see, see uh, some images of what a neural network looks like. And then here's, here's just a image of what a neural network looks like. So you've got your input layer. In this one, you have only one hidden layer, but with the neural networks, um, you can have more than one hidden layers as well. And then you have your output layer. 
So that's a picture. And we're look at the TensorFlow. You can so you can so we can actually see what it's doing. So are you guys are you guys able to pretty much see it? Um, so we, so you can actually see we're using we're basically using two two features. Um, so features are basically things that you're looking for, for an input. We've got um, one hidden layer. Um, we've got we've got uh, two hidden layers and we've got an output layer. So like as you as you can see this. This got a pretty good result. It was able to, to classify them. It was not real fast. Okay, so so a lot of times with a neural net, you want to tweak the parameters. And that kind of means that, it's like, for example, your number of neurons and your number of layers and stuff, you can tweak them. And also you can tweak your inputs. So let's say we're, go we're going to go ahead and try it with more, uh, more input features. And let's just watch how it runs. So you can see since we basically tweaked it, we added more features and stuff and ran faster. And um, that's just that's a little bit how it, a little bit how neural networks work. So it's not necessarily like they're magic. It's like you're tweaking the parameters. And so I don't know um, um, if, if uh, we'll look, we'll just look at some more examples, some other examples. You can kind of see from the lines and stuff which which layers um, which which layers and which input gets get most heavily weighted. And so this is a deep learning. So deep learning is also a name we we use them for stacked neural networks. So a lot of times so we've got a network composed of several layers. And so some of the challenges are uh, big data. A lot of times with deep deep learning you have a whole lot of data. And so, and um, so, what's one thing that's commonly used with AI is GPU processing, uh, which is kind of a common thing in supercomputing. Um, and these are this is graphical processing units. Um, so, with a so, for example, with a uh, supervised learning, you need an extensively labeled data set, which could be uh, in itself a very big challenge. Um, there. Are, so deep learning is not just security. It can be uh, applied to computer vision, speech recognition, natural language processing, social networking filters, uh, even uh, drug design and image, in image analysis. So just as far as how you prepare the data, um, first, is, first you do, you, you decide you're going to get your you're going to get your data selected in samples. Um, so, for example, you decide which data elements within our samples should be extracted and subjected to analysis. So, in machine learning, we call these data elements features. So, essentially, it was kind of like in the previous slides, um, we were looking at, we um, we were picking which features went into the neural network, and essentially, so features is uh, just what part of the data are you looking at. Um, so yeah, and typically um, machine learning algorithms require data to be encoded in some kind of mathematical fat, like some kind of mathematical function. Um, another thing we another thing we think about is normalization. Um, so for example, you're basically transforming your values to a to a uh, range between zero and one. Um, I don't know. So so for my little uh, so for my little uh, picture, I took a this is actually the town of Normal. We, Illinois literally has a town called Normal, uh, which is about maybe 50 miles away from me. So I'm pretty far from Normal. And here's here is just an example. Here is just an example of normalization. Like for example, you're uh, looking at your uh, request per sec per second in your CPU normalization, and you're just 
trans and you're basically just transforming these to values between zero and one. And this is just uh, one. Of, and, and this is just part of the. This is just uh, some of the things you have to do to, to uh, process values for um, deep learning. So with pattern and pattern recognition, this is actually really important in security. You're trying to discover explicit or latent characteristics hidden in the data. Um, and so, so, um, so for example, like what, well, like once you see these uh, characteristics, it's like you can say, well, so what else in the data might have these characteristics? And that's very useful in security. It's like you can detect, um, it's I, I like spam detection is one of the, uh, oldest and most common applications of machine learning and security. Um, botnets tend to have like these distinctive patterns of traffic. Um, so you can often detect um, botnets. And then there are also, when you analyze malware, there are also some like uh, characteristics show up again and again. So what? So there are a couple of things we do in a couple of things we do in machine learning um, called clustering and classification. We'll talk about right now about what cluster is. So clustering, it's pretty intuitive. Um, like like for example, um, you're trying to gather things. And so with security, the idea really is that uh, bad things happen together. And like uh, like for example, like a, like an attack or like. For example, we're going to have an example later when they talk about uh, incidents, where um, incident like where where that where um, incidents are kind of clustered together to, and that helps the SOC automate their workload a bit. Um, and there are a variety of there are a number of techniques. Um, K-means and DB scan are like a couple of the most common. Um, uh, DB scan basically does not require you to start with a defined number of clusters. Uh, K-means does. And we're going to look at an example that we're actually going to look at this example, like where they started, where they tried to cluster cluster incidents uh, for security for security uh, operation centers. So um, essentially, let's start, let's start this. So with Hierarchical clustering, they kind of discovered new, similar new incidents and tried to act on them together. And they're trying to associate new incidents with similar uh, reviewed ones and figure out how they were handled in the past. And that just saves a lot of SOC analyst time because uh, SOC people get to do a lot of uh, tedious crap and they spend a fair amount of time uh, triaging. And here's a graph. So with this, so one of the things they did was they took um, these events that were coming from a number of different sources and basically tried to arrange them together to uh, to uh, cor to correspond to, to collect collect the incidents and then they grouped them together into incidents. So they put stuff from different sources of input into the same in into the same incident. So like an incident was basically defined as a collection of incidents, a collection of events happening on the same machine and around the same time. And so a, a lot of times they have the same, the same root cause. Um, and so what they, what they did was that they were able to find, to say, well, this is happening on this one machine, this is happening on this one machine. Um, and they, they were able to identify similar clusters going on in another machine. And uh, they, this was, this was actually, this actually became part of Splunk and they were, and so they were able to just collect information about uh, what this incident was and how it was handled. And they were able to just apply that to stuff going on in other machines and they saved a whole lot of, S of time in the SOC, SOC analyst time. Here's another example of clustering. So th in this case, they're actually, they're actually looking at, they're actually going to take a look at PCAPs, which are uh, packet capture files to try to try to see to try to look at for malicious networking flow there. So what they did was they they took a whole bunch of PCAPs that uh, their product Trend Michael had already tagged as malicious. Um, so so a lot of times um, in your headers uh, you're going to see some kind of non-standard and unusual throw in unusual thing kind of in your uh, headers and and uh, payloads with malicious stuff. 
and they were able at, they were able to actually take these PCAPs and successfully cluster them into different kinds of malicious network flow. So here's your clustering takeaway. Um, so cl and clustering is a very general thing. It's I, I mean it's very it's very useful for security, but um, it's used in a whole lot of discipline, a whole lot of disciplines. Um, the results. Need to, the uh, results often, like ideally, you're, you're going to want them to be a statistically, statistically val very carefully evaluated. And um, one thing that's one thing that's very useful, like as we saw with the SOC thing, is that uh, a lot of times you you have uh, very large amounts of data that are that would be very time consuming for, for for human to, to uh, sift through, and so these clustering algorithms are very useful for uh, sifting through those. So classification is a little bit different. Um, classific classification is that you have a predefined class and you're trying to figure out whether your sample belongs to that predefined class. And so classif classification is an example of supervised learning. And so the thing about supervised learning is that you're building a model, you, you basically already know what the right answers are supposed to be. Like um, for example, and a sample can also, and just, saying a sample can also belong in, to uh, multiple classes at the same time. Um, and, and like, for example, as a practical real world example of uh, classification, we might want to classify like, like for example, like your email filter, um, do you, is the email benign, is it spam or is it phishing? Uh, that's, that's a very useful, that's a, that's a very good use for classification. And so here are some other examples you could do with classification. Um, so like bot, botnet command and controls usually have fairly, fairly uh, distinctive patterns of traffic because of the fact they, because like they have to kind of, they kind of have to re, they have to kind of phone home and communicate with whoever's controlling them. And they very often use HTTP requests. And so, and um, so they, so, one study they did, they basically did a uh, create they. Sorry, one study they created a decision tree model using um, using a G, using a uh, impurity measures. Trying to try to uh, oh sorry. So essentially, so essentially, in another another um, study, they created a decision tree and were able to successfully um, label nodes as botnets or benign based on analyzing HTTP traffic. So classification takeaways. So classification is a supervised learning model. It works pretty well when you have a, enough accurately labeled data, but that in itself could be kind of a challenge because it's like uh, who's going to come up with all the accurate, accurately labeled data, data that that becomes a big a, a big challenge. Um, so very often with uh, classification, um, you you separate your data into training and testing data. So you need to train it. You make make sure that your training data is correct, and then you, then you plug in your testing data and see if that's works. And then and then if if it works. And then if, if it works, then you deploy it. Um, one, thing, one thing about classification is that it's not an absolute, or, uh, it's not, uh, an absolute yes or no. It's saying, so what is the probability that a new unlabeled sample belongs to a class? So, so, it's, uh, so you had to maybe decide what your thresholds are. Like what your thresholds are, what's your minimum probability you're comfortable with. So here's another example. Uh, this was Microsoft Research. They were using, so I don't know if you're familiar with malicious PowerShell scripts. They're very often, like very often um, malicious PowerShell scripts are kind of obfuscated. It, um, kind of deliberately. And so, um, so essentially what Microsoft decided to do was rather than trying to manually figure out what exactly these PowerShell meant they decided to just try to figure out whether these PowerShell scripts were malicious or not. 
Um, so they actually they use this technique called contextual embedding. And they use something called the word to vec algorithm. And they extracted tokens from, so, so they had a uh, large training set of uh, PowerShell scripts that they had already determined whether they were malicious or not. And so rather than just like analyzing the raw script, they used, they used these word to vec to uh, extract um, tokens. And they also extracted, uh, and they were, and the word spec also extracts some context around tokens, so you can get a sense of the whether the tokens are related to each other, um, whether, for example, like you have something that's negating it. Uh, um, so the, so they did that, and they found that this. So they were able to. So they actually noticed um, these things. I don't know if you can see the uh, the uh, slide, but you know they noticed these things that were occurring kind of in close proximity to each other and it doesn't show in the slides exactly but uh I mean, it doesn't show this slide but they were all but in powershell scripting they very often use um aliases in powershell scripting and they their techniques were very were also very effective in finding um aliases So essentially, it was pretty it was pretty successful. I mean, again, they used the uh, they used the training set that uh, PowerShell scripts that they were already labeled clean or malicious, and they did recognize aliases, and uh, it, it that se that seemed that seemed pretty like a pretty impressive result. And so that so that was that was a very so that was this was an example of natural language processing, which is kind of a a pretty big uh, a pretty a pretty big part of uh, of machine learning. Um, and then basically, like so, where else in um, in security might uh, natural language processing be used? Um, spam detection again is also a very big part of that. Oh, I just saw I just saw Megan's comment. Um, yeah, uh, sometimes goofy characters that you won't see in normal stuff shows up a lot. Sorry, I just saw your comment, Megan. So essentially, so we also got something called anomaly detection. So, 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 um, one thing like when you got say your traditional antivirus. Actually, your traditional antivirus engine, it depends on signatures, it depends on, so it depends on recognizing stuff you've seen before. And so that gets, that gets really interesting when you've got something you haven't seen before, like, for example, like, say, a zero day or something, like, a, your, your typical AB is not going to pick up a, uh, is not, is uh, not going to pick up a zero day because there's no, it has no signature. It's never seen it before. So what we're doing here is we're going to, we're looking at something called anomaly detection. And so essentially um, anomaly detection is just looking for things that are weird. So what you need to do there is decide what do you consider normal? Um, and, the, and then the, uh, so the, so if you have something that deviates from normal, not even necessarily bad, you're going to call that an outlier. In security, like like an anomaly, it's not necessarily so. Essentially, unusual behavior is not necessarily bad, but it correlates very highly with things that you want to detect and prevent, like fraud and other things. So, in security, um, anomalies might very often mean that you've got an intruder or another kind of breach. So for example, what do we really want to see in an intrusion detection? Okay, so um, so they say you want to have low false positives and false negatives. So a false positive is when you get like a report that something bad is going on, but it really isn't. And so that's a problem because it wastes, it can waste a lot of SOC analyst time. It can, and it could also make people, it could also teach people to uh, start ignoring the IDS. Uh, a false negative is also very bad. That tells you that everything's fine, but it's not. There is something actually is something is bad. Um, so you, so you essentially want it to be fairly easy to work with. You preferably not a monster learning curve. 
so so basic so threats and attacks change very fast very quickly you you want to be able to adapt to that um you and you you might have only a certain amount of computing power and space and resources to get to donate to uh dedicate to it so you might want to stay within that and then there's something called um explainable alerts and so when you talk about explainable it's like it's like your ids says something bad is going on you want to be able to track tr trace down why it thinks that that is yeah that's that's kind of an important thing so like for example with an explainable with an explainable with an explainable alert you don't want to like disable somebody's account without knowing why Well, here's your, so this is, uh, when you're looking at host uh, intrusion detecting signals, these are just some of the things that you might look at. You might look at processes, like if you're seeing a new process that you've never seen before, is that legitimate or is it not? Um, like, like do, do you now have a, do you have a new user account when you didn't actually create one? Um, your kernel modules, um, like, your DNS, your DNS lookups, like, is it look, is you, are you starting to have, like, these DNS queries that are looking up, like, sketchy.ru or something like that? Maybe that's not good. Uh, unexplainable network connections. And then, um, like, a lot of times, like, with, with your operating system, it maintains some kind of registry or database with its configuration. Um, like, the registry would be Windows. And if you start seeing um, new things popping up in that, that's not very good. So this is this is a just a fairly useful tool. Um, OS query. So it can uh, so OS query can measure reliability and compliance, but it is often used for intrusion detections. Um, what might it be looking for? Like uh, for example, you could use OS query to look at your top five memory hogging processes. And um, I so one one limitation is that it is not. It is not really built to be to operate in an untrusted environment, and it doesn't. So OS Query does not have built-in or orchestration, but it does play nicely with like Chef and Ansible and Puppet if you want to run that. That's that is just a fairly that is just a very pretty useful tool. Um, so let's talk a little bit about network intrusion detection. So it typically, like as we said before, so you have a compromised host. It's very often going to be um, initiating. Oh, th thank you. It's very often going to be initiating some kind of communication with the outside the outside world um, because it needs to reach out to uh, what to whatever is controlling it. And you like for example, like you can't really you can't connect really count on um, whatever's controlling to be able to uh, reach out to the compromised machine. I mean the networking firewall settings may not allow that. And um, basically, here are some examples. I mean, you've got your botnets. Um, a lot of times, like your APTs are typically going to allow remote uh, access. So then you've got your typical adware and spyware. And just some some tools. Uh, I mean, well, TCP TCP dump is pretty much a standard for network monitoring. Um, then there's uh, Snort, and there's a, and Zeek, which was also which was formerly known as Bro, which you can do a lot of really cool things with. Though there is somewhat of a learning curve. And network intrusion has typically has typically used uh, signatures in the past. Yeah, just for for what it is worth, just to, uh, going back to Snort and Bro. Snort is a fairly simple rule-based engine. Um, Bro kind of offers the deep packet inspection, which can generate a whole lot of uh, features for anomaly detection. Like for example, you might be able to detect pivoting. Um, it, it will offer some um, geolocation and more detailed information about net, about uh, networks like uh, ASN and Netflix and stuff if you want that.
And then, he, and then here's another um, web application intrusion detection. That's you know, like your web applications are very often are, are I think your web applications uh, are like very often targets. <clears throat> so like what, like uh, what's your, so you're typically like your source of data with your web applications is often like your HTTP logs. Um, and it's true, like, for example, um, like with your typical Apache, um, whatever, it does not necessarily log post data by default, but you can, you can get add-ons that do. Um, let's see, so, so you can look at, yeah, you can look at IP level, access level statistics. I mean, for example, uh, if a, if a, machine in a country that's that would not typically like do business with you that's often hostile is repeatedly accessing your web your app that might be some that might be um something bad your um I mean so like your uh, URL string aberrations um they so they may be trying to uh escape characters or uh, experiment with like null byte string termination um and also, like, just an unusual sequence of action might also signal fuzzing. And fuzzing is essentially when you just start directing a whole, whole lot of different kinds of input in hopes that you will discover something. Um, let's see, so unusual refer, refer patterns. Um, so one thing, like, if you're using, like, an automatic automated tool like uh, curl or something like that, I mean, unless you explicitly set it, uh, your... Um, you may have like no, you may um, your referral patterns and your agent and stuff may, might look a little bit unusual, and it's it's not that using curl is bad, but uh, that does mean that they're so they're throwing something automated at your system. And just a sequence of access to endpoints again that would suggest that they're uh, that they're ba that they're basically uh, that they're basically crawling. Or possibly look trying to look for something that's something that's not good, or trying to look for something that's vulnerable. So forecasting. So the the idea with forecasting is that. The forecasting itself is kind of an, a, it's actually a very intuitive way of performing um, anomaly detection. So we learn from our prior, we learn from our prior data. And so from our prior data, we try to make it, we try to predict what may happen in the future. And we start looking, so if what we're experiencing is significantly different than what we predicted, um, we, we would consider that anomalous. Um, and so you're, with your more, uh, with your more, sophisticated pattern you can also recognize um, trends and seasons like for example if you have uh, uh, basically like periodic repetitions of patterns in the data um, you like a more sophisticated algorithm would be able to recognize that so we're looking at arima the auto regressive integrated moving patterns. So, yeah, and so auto regressive just means that you've got a statistical model that's basically dependent on its own past. So like auto correlation is like, uh, how does the, how does uh, the, what's present correlate with what's in the past? So essentially, I don't. I, it's it's kind of hard to it's hard to tell. Uh, I don't know if you guys want me to go into this or not. Um, but let's see. So this would here is an example of for here is an example of the of the uh, data series. So you can see kind of this cycle, but it's overall trending trending upward. So like, uh, well, like, so why would we care about this for security? Um. Like uh, in, in this one, in this one, we're maybe seeing a diurnal pattern, like stuff that occurs every 24 hours, and uh, um, with an overall trend. So let's look. So how about we apply this to security? 
In this case, we're going to have um, CPU utilization over time. So why would we, um, so for example, why would we care about CPU utilization? So if your CPU, so if your CPU utilization is off, uh, it might mean something unusual is going on and it's not necessarily bad. I mean, maybe somebody dropped an update on you or something. Uh, there's maybe there's a legitimate reason for it, or maybe a uh, Bitcoin miner is gracing your system with his presence, or maybe something else bad is going on. But uh, CPU utilization could be could be an, um, an indicator of of some kind of compromise or an or an anomaly you might want to look into. So it's essentially in this case, in this case we're we're using our CPU we're fitting it, our CPU utilization with an ARIMA model to see how close it is. Yeah, in this, in this case, we're starting to see something that's off, something, something is different than what we expect. Here we've got our actual observed data points, and it's not really following a trend. Something's going, something is, something is off um and we might and so it's like you might want to look into what is going on in that server so we go on so malware analysis is another thing you would you can use uh, machine learning to do um uh, typically with malware analysis you kind of you group it by family you've got like your code and capability a lot of times it maybe comes from a comes from a group and you'll see uh, and for example, it's common to see mal one kind of malware that's derived from another. Um, the traditional, traditional approach to malware analysis, it's kind of like virus that you have a signature, um, it's, which is basically a collection of known data and you try to match it to something known from before. Um, and you, you can also, you can also do, um, um, you, you can also do something, uh, do, use techniques called static and dynamic analysis. Um, Static analysis would be like um, when basic, basically when you uh, just take the take the code take it apart, disassemble it or something, and maybe for example, like start looking for interesting strings, which show show up a lot in malware. Um, dynamic analysis might be like when you run it in like a VM sandbox or something like that. And you can have uh, you also have metamorphic and polymorphic malware analysis, for example, like the uh, Conficker family. So, for example, what might you see when you're analyzing um, uh, potential Android malware? Well, for example, you might see um, interesting strings. Um, like, for example, what kinds of interesting strings might you see? You might see references to system binary. You might see server addresses. Like, you've got it. Like, you've got a hard coded IP. What's it? What's that doing? Um, you've got uh, checks for for emulated environments. Uh, you know. Uh, why would you want to do that? Um, um, like, okay, so why might they want to check for an emulated environment? Because they want to know if it's running in a sandbox. And and also kind of like, as we saw with the PowerShell scripts, um, obfuscation also shows up a lot. And, um, and then, you're, then, you're, then you're also looking for, uh, like, I guess, a, you, uh, kind of sketchy API calls. Um, and also potentially uh, changes to the changes to your system. So typically, what are the limitations of? Uh, so you can do a lot of very useful things with machine learning, um, but it's not really a silver bullet. I had to put this picture there to show to be basically to show my age. I don't know if anybody else recognizes it or not. Um, but essentially, there is essentially it's no silver bullet, silver bullet. Like as we talked about earlier, um, there's like ex like explainability is a problem. Like for example, like if you get a result and it's not really if you get if it sends you a warning um, and it's not really clear why why it did it or where it came from and you are not sure whether you can act on it. Um, and all and like with the vast body of human knowledge, it's like people know a whole lot of things. Um, and you can't just dump it raw into a machine learning system. You have to find a way to represent all that knowledge in a way that um, that a machine can under can understand, and that can be quite challenging. 
there's oh yeah thank you thank you very much leah leah i'm i'm not, um i'm i'm so old i can remember hear, hearing his songs as a kid thank you so thank you so i'm so glad somebody else recognized him and then there's something called overfitting and underfitting that we didn't really talk about um so essentially uh, overfitting is like, is like, for example, when you, when you have a model that fits the training data very, very well, but then it doesn't, but it, it fits only the training data and it doesn't do, so it fits the training data so well that it, that it's, it uh, performs less well with real world data. And then under underfitting is like when it doesn't fit the, the training data very well. Um, it, I mean, it, it just, it doesn't fit the data very well. It's too general to be useful. And then another very big problem with um, with machine with machine learning, it's the whole idea of garbage in, garbage out. Probably like we've all heard, we've all heard about, we've all heard that phrase with computers in general. Um, so so uh, with machine, well with machine learning, uh, there's a lot of problems with that. Um, one thing that's a particular particular issue here is that machine is that um, machine learnings can be deliberately exposed to uh, malicious input. And in fact, there's a lot of papers on machine learning and security. Like if somebody just uh, deliberately uh, sprays a system with bad data, uh, you're going to have a bad model. And so, if you want to learn more about that, you could probably Google. Like you probably just do a search on like adversarial machine learning. So essentially, some of the takeaways. Um, there's so there's um, a lot of potential to automate just some of the tedious tasks and save uh, like SOC analyst time, and that's good. Um, detecting anomalies is is good. Like for example, particularly for example with the uh, zero days or novel or APTs or something that that don't have known signatures and wouldn't be detected by like a traditional um, engine. Uh, I mean, you still have a risk of error. You could get a, you could get a, you could get your time wasted with a bunch of false positives or could fail to catch problems. So my, my takeaway is that I think it could save a lot of time. It could, you could do a lot of really cool, interesting things, but I think you're, there's still going to be a need for competent security professionals. It's not going to take your, uh, it's not going to take your jobs away. Uh, so please don't worry. And Here's some machine learning, just just some links to machine learning software, and I will post my slides. I'm Wayward710 on Twitter, and I'll go ahead and post the slides just in case there's any useful information in them. I post the whole PowerPoint slide, and I wanted to get some some credit to places to to uh, some of the books and stuff that I'd use to get to get some of my examples. Like the machine learning and security is an especially good book, and yeah, I at least in the past have been able to get it through Humble Bundle which is a really good deal. And the, and, uh, the, silent, the silence uh, book, believe it or not, is free, and that's really not bad. Then I just put some other resources for anybody that anybody might be interested in. And, oh, so, oh, thanks, thanks, Megan, uh, and thanks, Rachid. Um, yeah, actually, Megan, I did put, I put some links, some uh, resources in my slides, and I will post the slides. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yeah, thank you very much, Leah. That's me. And seriously, thank you for listening to me. This was, this was, it was really, it's, it's really, it's really kind of weird presenting virtually and in front of a, uh, in front of a live audience. But I thank you for staying with me. Uh, does anybody have any questions while we still have time? Or any questions? I think I saw one earlier, but I was hoping maybe it could be reworded. Yeah, that one. Uh, to practically Im implement DDoS attack using ensemble learning. Um, let's see, to be honest, I, I really do not know that answer off the top of my head. I'm very sorry. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, 
like uh, Rachid, I would be happy to try to maybe Google that for you. But just unfortunately, I, don't, I do not have a good answer to that off the top of my head. Oh, gosh, thank you so much. Oh, um, um, Megan, uh, does bias and impact security and analysis data sets? Um, I would say quite possibly because um, quite possibly, like I know that it's a problem with real world data sets. I mean, like we've got, like there's some known problems with, um, for example, racism being introduced into algorithms and potentially causing a lot of trouble. I don't know if anybody saw the Netflix slide that talked about the the algorithmic justice league is worth searching for. Um, with uh, with computer security, um, I, I would say like for example, with the supervised learning, you're you're getting your uh, pre labeled data sets, and so it's possible like if you had some less than entirely accurate data sets going into a supervised learning um, class, like for example, you use for classification, it's quite possible that could influence the the uh, results. Yeah, thank you so much. That is, and there was a Netflix special about that, it, and I've been really very impressed with the work that group's done. Oh yeah, thank you so much. All right, well, if there's no more questions, I just wanna say this was a great talk. We got a lot of conversation that was going on. People really seem to appreciate it. So thank you so much for your time, Wendy. And thank I you hope so much. Yeah, thank you so much. And I hope everybody here has a great day. Thank you. Thank you.